This is Kaylee Christensen. And this is Kelly Oriard. This is a lesson in trust. trust. What would you say your earliest memory together of being creative is? Because you have been friends since you were 14 years old. You know, that freshman year of high school, it's like between freshman year and sophomore year where you get your driver's license or going into sophomore year at some point. And I think at, from that point on, it was just Kelly and I always on adventures doing things, mm -hmm. even if it was just like taking pictures on a um, camera and getting them developed. Like it was just something to do, right? Like as a high schooler, I think if TikTok had existed back in the day, we would have had TikTok <laughs> accounts. There was this one moment where we like captured a bee. <laughs> And, and froze it and then like tied a string around it to like have it. it this actually sounds really it like sounds we like were... animal cruelty. I know. Oh, I know. Oh, my God. <laughs> How would you tell that story? I don't know. I mean, I think in general, like we were just getting into <laughs> mischief, obviously, but trying to like think of just fun. Can I just ask you, wait, what were you trying to do with the bee? We tied a piece of floss around it. So it had like a leash on it. <laughs> Oh, no. But then it backfired oh. and it, like the bee flew at us. So then, of course, we like <laughs> released the bee. I just remember thinking, too, that when we were in high school and when we were hanging out, we always liked to be having fun. And one thing that I started to notice when we were in high school was that boys got to do things like that and like have fun. And that was sort of expected. Like our guy friends were like out hiking and doing things and not sitting around like thinking about girls and I always felt like really bothered by that that we weren't doing that because that's mm -hmm. sort of like it was the, before we really understood kind of those concepts we I noticed that difference and so I was always like hey we got to get out and do things too we should be doing <laughs> things like this you know it's true Kelly's always been the one that's like let's get out like let's go do something mm-hmm and I had I the driver's that. license first, so I was always <laughs> the driver and Kelly was the <laughs> director over what we were doing. <laughs> you have six children between your families and your journey is, as moms was the reason that you actually started your company, Slumberkins. So can you take us back? What happened and why did you start it? Well, we started Slumberkins when we were on a dual maternity leave together from our roles as educators. So my background is special education teacher and Kelly's is a marriage and family therapist and school counselor. And it was about four and a half years ago now that we were on that maternity leave. And it was just us getting out, doing things, going on walks like we normally do. And we had this kind of creative moment of inspiration of talking about the children that we both worked with in the schools and then also looking at our newborn babies and feeling this moment of inspiration around what kind of interventions could be done before kids get to school in the world of emotional wellness that we were trying to, you know, support and work with on a daily basis with our students. Yeah. And I think we, you know, had this moment where we were coming up with ideas, we were being creative, coming up with the concept of slumberkins, which is cuddly snugglers, which are like lovies in unique creatures with stories that go along with them that are interactive for parent and child to deepen the bond of connection together, but also infuse these deep, you know, emotional guideposts basically for wellness. And as we were thinking about that, you know, the idea was big and we'd never started a business. We had no business <laughs> background, no classes in business, barely passed uh, math 111. I had to cry my way through it and call it. <laughs> Despite not having any business background, we were so passionate about the idea and thought, why not us? Why couldn't we do it? I mean, look around, look at the people on Instagram that are selling and people that are doing things like we have the background, we have this idea, let's, let's do it. Why not us? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we taught ourselves to sew. We actually had to borrow. We borrowed $200 from Kelly's mom because we were on unpaid maternity leaves. So we were completely broke. Yeah. Yeah. My husband would have been really mad if yeah. I took $200 out of the account to start my little craft side project. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we taught ourselves to sew, but then we turned that $200 worth of fabric into, I think we sold it our first like local holiday craft fair. And we turned that into about, I think it was around $700. Mm -hmm. And then we just, you know, 
opened our first bank account and then just went from there. We reinvested all of the money back into more fabric and just kept going and making more. And that was kind of the very beginning grassroots side of Slumberkins. And they were always paired with a storyline. But, you know, back in the day, we didn't know how to illustrate and publish a book. And so they were just the written words published on cardstock, like a poem that then the creatures came wrapped around and bound with twine. So it was very much this like fun, crafty, creative moment that we shared while on maternity leave together that then once we were going back to the schools, to our roles as educators, it was really hard to be like, uh oh, so what's going to happen to Slumber Kid? Like, what's going to happen now? Like, the, it's gotten so much traction. We've sold out at all. Your baby. Yeah. 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 And so, for a minute there, I had tried to pitch the storylines to publishing houses and book agents and just received polite no thank yous, <laughs> <laughs> which was like, oh man, but this needs to live on. And so, yes. even then, when we w- both went back to work part time as educators, we still kept it going, mm-hmm. and which was a very intense looking back. I don't know how we did it. No. I think we're both just like really intense people. We're both really tall. Kaylee's six <laughs> two, I'm six foot, and we both played. So that's preface to we both played sports and we're trained at like high level athletes. So Kaylee's a basketball player. I'm a volleyball player. We both played Division One in college on scholarship and both played professionally overseas. So we're kind of used to this ride of entrepreneurship through our experience in sports as well. Of just there's no failure, really. You're just learning constantly for this big win in the future. And I really think it translated to the mentality that we brought to the business. So many of the structures we measure by are masculine. And what I love about this idea is that emotion lives in the realm of the feminine and it's undervalued. But yet, in this moment in particular, having a strong emotional foundation is what's going to serve a lot of people during this moment, what serves us throughout our lives, throughout all of the transitions that we have in life. I think, you know, it's so interesting because I love the words on your website. You talk about an intentional children's brand. How did you come up with that? And what did you mean by that? When we were thinking about the products that we would create as a brand, we wanted to create products that we ourselves wanted to use that we couldn't find out there at traditional retail or even online at the time that was, you know, kind of a a product that brought purpose and meaning and deeper connection between parent and child and created a really easy to use approachable routine that really, Kelly's background as a therapist lends itself so perfectly to this because she writes all of the storylines. She also happens to be a natural born poet, (laughs) luckily. But the, the information that's coming through the books is actually like distilled down messages that children need to hear from their parents from a very early stage to build the emotional wellness building blocks. And so when we thought about, you know, saying we are an intentional brand, you know, it's it's so much different than what you see. People have asked us, aren't you afraid of someone like Mattel or Hasbro knocking you off? And we're mm. like, I mean, they can try, but they're not too like moms and educators that are fueling everything they have into this product. Like, and we think that consumers in this day and age see right through that, you know, like you can put a sticker on a product at retail and say endorsed by Dr. So-and-so, but it doesn't really go that far in today's, I think, consumer climate, but we- Well, I'm looking at your Facebook page and you have such engagement from your moms there and it says high responsive rate, right? So that you are in real communication with the moms and the teachers and you have so many points of collaboration on your website from a business standpoint. So I think that's really, and Kelly doing videos there and really letting people get to know you. I think people- want to support smaller businesses and you're not that small anymore. I guess we've, I mean, we've grown a lot. It's sometimes a a bit surreal. We pinch ourselves walking into the office. We have about 20 people on the team now, which has just been incredible. You know, that in four and a half years, we've went from an idea and teaching ourselves to sew to where we are now has just been sort of a rocket ship. And I think it's a testament to the need for the product and the need for these kind of conversations that 
I think are just getting framed up for adults right now. I think Mm -hmm. millennials are the therapy generation where a lot of people are interested in digging in, understanding their paths, understanding, you know, their internal systems and how it's, you know, playing out or causing different things to pop back up in their lives, these patterns that they see. And, you know, Slumberkins is really about helping parents take that a step further to doing something for their children that maybe they didn't hear explicitly out loud and helping guide that, whether they're doing that internal work themselves or not. The messages are coming through for children. And, you know, we think that that's something really unique that nobody is doing at this point. It's kind of the next stage to the emotional identification has happened through, you know, Daniel Tiger's neighborhood and the work of Fred Rogers and Sesame Street and different people who do focus on this. But what's the next step? You were on Shark Tank. Oh, yeah. Tell me about that experience. Oh, it was so intense and so stressful. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, because as you have heard, we started out hand making them. And at the time when we were going on Shark Tank, we were still like hand sewing them. And the ones that we gave to them had been handmade. And we rushed to print our stories into board book form just to have them on TV at Shark Tank because we were scrambling to professionalize ourselves so that we could reach more people. And so Shark Tank was really that moment when we switched from being a side hustle to a a brand that had a mission that was exposed to a much larger audience. And it helped us transition from people maybe seeing us as cute little mom hand-stitched creatures with these kind of cute stories to a mission-based product fueled by, you know, an educator and a therapist. So that was a really awesome for for us. Yeah. And then behind the scenes, you know, we left our positions as educators when we got word that we were going to film Shark Tank. So that was another thing where it catapulted us into taking the business more seriously. But like Kelly said, Mm -hmm. it was, it was the reason we took the time to really develop a brand platform, a big vision, really think bigger for the brand. And as soon as we were all in on that, it just, even having those own goals for ourselves, it helped us redefine what our goal was for the business. And I can say too, like the kind of fake it till you make it thing was like definitely happening for us. That was literally the first time that we ever pitched to investors was on Shark Tank. We had Mm. no idea (laughs) what we were doing. And look, I have this thing that you're not faking it once you start the action. You're actually in making it mode. Yeah. And that that's clear. What happened after the pitch? Because they said no. We were in there for about an hour and they show maybe, you know, 10 minutes. And so it was great. They were all they were all very nice and they loved the idea. They did have they did get hung up on like the plush product itself of it being in the toy category. And they were comparing it to like pillow pets. So yeah, they there missed was, the point a little there bit. There was a little bit of a them. disconnect, I would say. Mark Cuban got it the most, and he had told us, like, he saw what it could become in the sense of having more storylines around each character. And, of course, when we were on there, we were like, we're going to have a, you know, a streaming series. And they were like, oh, yeah, everyone says that. But what's exciting is that we actually are in development of a streaming <laughs> yes, series. Yes, Yay. I think and can you tell us with who? Yes, so we're in a co-production with the Jim Henson Company um, to develop a preschool series based on our characters and Kelly and I are co-executive producers on the show and so it's just like I mean it's a definite pinch me moment. Every time I say it, I can't stop smiling about it. <laughs> I know. It's so exciting. It's it's those things though when you it's what you were talking about, the fake it till you make it. You know, we said it on Shark Tank. We said we want this series. We're going to have it. They laughed at us. And we said, watch, you know, and I think when you say your goals and you have a vision and you Mm -hmm. continually get up and work towards it and don't see any failure or any, there was a lot of things that went haywire and sideways before that opportunity presented itself. But here we are (laughs) and now the rest is history. And Mm -hmm. so it's, it's really powerful to, uh, you know, really be focused on where you're going, but not the minutia and the details of how because not the how it, not the it how. unfolds and if you follow it you can get really far to go from crafter to online entrepreneur 
Are you in stores? Tell us that landscape. Well, so we are in some brick and mortar stores and we've been in some select retailers, but you know, obviously that's shifting 90, but the great news for, I mean, (laughs) the great news for our brand is like, we've always been direct to consumer and we've always been online. And so 90% of our revenue has been through slumberkins.com. So we've never depended on stores to sell the product. We actually think no one sells a product better than the the brand itself. And so telling the story around the brand has been key for us. And so we bootstrapped the company to over 1.5 million before we mm-hmm. took in any sort of outside funding. And this is in four years, well, right? right? That so, was, or that was in two. That was in the first That two. was in 20. 20- 18 that we took in we ended up we ended up actually raising like friends and family investment round in 2018 and it wasn't until that point i mean we had no bar- marketing budget we had we didn't really have a budget we didn't <laughs> do any then. digital advertising it was all organic community based collaborating with other brands sharing audiences it was all through mutual collaboration and storytelling so it was like after shark tank we started learning what is fundraising and how do you do that and so then through 2018 we really learned what that would be for and how we could do it took our first money in yeah that that year we before the money came in we were at one and a half million without any support from anybody yet. Yeah, that was really, I mean, that goes back to the community that you can cultivate and connect with online, you know, and like that is the reason why we have such a high responsive rate because we as a brand ourselves are really engaged with our community. We don't leave a single comment unanswered or acknowledged and we're constantly engaging and we always hear that that makes such a huge difference for consumers. And so we've really built this base of a, of a community. And then the 1.5 million in revenue was really up until we took in the first money. And then since then, now we've like done almost 7 million lifetime. And so amazing. it's just been this, like, like Kelly said, it's a rocket it. ship. It's like been a tidal wave that's felt like it's just like been pushing us forward. And it really is. It has its, its life of its own, you know, and sometimes as the founders, it does feel like we are sprinting to keep up with it mm-hmm. and to, you know, without having the formal business education, it can feel mind bending to like wrap your brain around the the business side that you do have to eventually keep up with. I think you can have the formal education and it would still be mind bending. I Mm -hmm. think the fact that I think that it has grown so much because of the innocence, Mm -hmm. honestly, and the determination and the vision of the mission. Mm -hmm. You're not too much in your heads. You're literally listening and responding Mm -hmm. to what the 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 thing, the fluffy people are asking of you, right? Like you're literally responding to that. Like I said, we pinch ourselves sometimes when we walk in, we see how many people are working with us now. Even just hearing our lifetime revenue sometimes makes me go, oh my gosh, that's crazy. But the other thing that we're learning is how to mindfully and in a way that's aligned with what we're putting out, how we build a team and build a community within Slumberkins too. And so like you know, the team that we have now and the people that we're hiring and how we're structuring the business is, you know, so awesome. And I think so much of the, the revenue and all of that, like it all plays into each other around like building something really based in strength and emotional growth and learning too. Well, and structuring the team and the business so that there's a firm foundation for the big vision that we have so that Mm -hmm. we can be a legacy brand like a Mr. Rogers or Sesame Mm -hmm. Street so that we can be a legacy brand for the children of future generations that, you know, can fondly look back on their experience with Slumberkins as a child and also have the memory of their parent being more connected to them and being able to support them in their emotional wellness too. We've taken in a bigger round of funding. And so we're always trying to think of ways to be able to control our own destiny, especially when you take in outside money. As business owners, that's been kind of the learning curve too, around making sure that we don't have to take investment. We're not like, we're not running ourselves into a wall of running out of money, but we're really setting the brand up for long-term success. Mm-hmm. So I want to talk about your relationship because that has been the foundation when you talked about team building and you talked about strength. I see that so much in the two of you and your relationship. How did you navigate 
I mean, there are marriages that don't even navigate doing business together. So to have a friendship that has been through so many milestones, to be pregnant at the same time, which was a brilliant setup, honestly. <laughs> how did <laughs> how did you navigate that journey? And what were the struggles, if any? Similar to just many people, you know, our relationship started out as like friends that were having fun together early years in high school. And we had this base of like going through difficult times together, like going through being adolescents, going through college and supporting each other. So we had this real history of trust in each other and how we showed up for each other through those times. We were never the kind of friends that were like, oh, you're struggling at school. Sorry. Hope you could feel better. Call me later. Like we would show up for each other. And I think that alongside us always just having so much fun together was the reason that we came together for Slumberkins. And having a business together has definitely pushed us to edges that we didn't know existed between us. You know, our relationship has deepened and you know, we've had bumps and hiccups and um, along the way really had to do a lot of personal work and relationship work together. We both are in therapy and we have the same therapist and we do sessions together sometimes and we do individual sessions and <laughs> we do couple sessions. So, you know, it's like an extended family. Yeah. It's definitely like a platonic business marriage. <laughs> <laughs> it has transitioned to that. For like, And then, you know, also making time to still just be friends outside of the business and hang out. And I mean, our kids are also best friends. So it makes it easy on the weekends to hang out and kind of leave Slumberkins for the weekdays. But oftentimes, I don't know, we do find ourselves talking about Slumberkins. Our, <laughs> our partners are just like, oh, stop it. But <laughs> as a teacher, background, my whole career was built on collaborating with others. And so I think our backgrounds lend itself well to it also. And sometimes, like Kelly said, it has not been easy. Like there have been like full on fights that mm -hmm. we've had to say, all right, we're going to shut ourselves in a room and like until we come out with a conclusion over how we're both on the same page to then present to the team so that there's never a divided front. That's been kind of one of the things for us that we've had to implement so that neither one of us will ever undermine the other one in front of the team. And that's kind of a, that's a thing that we've had to work on to just really build trust on. But even in the early days, we went and pulled out a Venn diagram and we defined, okay, what's Kelly going to own in the business? Where am I, what am I going to own in the business? And then where is it that we have shared leadership and say, and where we both need to agree on. And that really helped, I think, mm -hmm. when defining like the co-CEO roles, because that does come up in questions, especially from investors, if you want to present as co-CEOs. Didn't you have somebody ask you, well, who's the real boss? Yeah, like who's the, which one of you is really in charge? And that's actually the thing that I think pushed us into having those harder conversations and diving into our self-work. And I'll say, you know, I love your platform the of finding your voice just because mm -hmm. there's been so many times where Kelly, it has felt like Kelly has had to shove me into stepping into myself and finding my own voice in our journey and kind of just like pulling me up to her level of like, come on, you can do it. Say what you need to say. <laughs> do you mind sharing where you had difficulty using your voice? Slumberkins from a marketing perspective was really built off of gut and intuition on my end in the world of social media and community building. And then I think as we grew and needed to hire an experts, it was really hard for me to be able to communicate a vision that then the team could execute on because I had just been so used to doing it myself. Doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I had to take some like real big kind of learning moments to really understand like how I was getting triggered in meetings if I felt like I wasn't being heard or listened to by the team and like getting frustrated myself on like, I don't understand how they don't under, like they can't execute what I'm saying. And so there are many times that Kelly has said, okay, let's just like get in a room and she'll help pull information out of me that then's more, that then is more actionable. And so there's a big difference from like doing it yourself to then being able to articulate it and articulate it clearly. And then if someone it's like the leadership voice, right? Like, 
as a teacher, I was always the teacher doing it. And even though I was instructing with students, it's like, it's the difference of also empowering your team below you to then try to execute against a vision. And I think I'm still working on that. Like, always (laughs) always. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's it's also just this concept of, you know, trust and shared power and making the implicit explicit, right? So we're trying to do that with our product. We're trying to do that for families. And if we as co-CEOs are not able to show up to share power, to be explicit about what we're being triggered by or what's going on a little bit below the surface with each other and with what's going on in our lives, then we're not walking the walk of what we're trying trying to do in the world. And so we're very focused on keeping that very much aligned in our relationships, in our lives, so that we're able to let Slumberkins be what it is supposed to be. You know, and if we don't do that ourselves, we might get in the way of what Slumberkins could be. The co-CEOs piece aside, would you say that women lead differently? And if yes, are you comfortable calling it feminine leadership? I would say that in general, probably women do lead differently. I would say that I hope that there are men that also lead in a way that's balanced and also brings this kind of more traditionally feminine, intuitive leadership that we're really leaning into. But in general, I would say, yes, probably women do lead differently. And we very much fall in the camp of leaning into intuition, being very mindful and focused on our team's emotional wellness, growth, our emotional wellness and growth, and how that is connected directly to the work that they produce. Now, in our case, it all connects together because that's what our product is about. We hear from our team and from people who work with us that it is a very different culture and it is a place where people feel safe to bring up vulnerable things at times. We have coaches that work with us that help people identify, you know, how they approach tasks and maybe triggers and shadow self that might show up in the workplace and how to help themselves bring themselves back to best self. And I think just even focusing on those things, there's a trend towards that in general, I think in business, but we feel like we're leading the charge in that. So if I asked you to complete the sentence, my wish for every other woman is? Ooh, mine is to step into their power, to live their truth. You have all of the answers when you ask the right questions. Be visible. Speak your truth. Every other woman needs you to lead.